It doesn't start with a big movement of people and hands flying up in the air. It starts with the individual. It starts with you. Just give you some background into who we're talking about tonight. This is, if not my favorite, one of my top, fa top five favorite Old Testament people and characters, King Josiah. Now here's the thing about King Josiah. His grandfather is named Manasseh, and Manasseh is literally the most evil king in Judah's history. And his dad was just like his grandfather just incredibly evil. His great-grandfather, however, was Hezekiah, who's one of the best kings in the history of the kingdom of Judah. Here's how it went down. After David, David had Solomon, and then after Solomon passed away, he passed the whole kingdom of Israel off to his son Rehoboam. Well, Rehoboam kind of messed with the people and taxed the people so much and didn't take good advice, so there was a split among the people and they had a civil war, and the kingdom of Israel split into two, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Well, this lasted for quite a while, but in 722 BC, the northern kingdom of Israel got taken over by the Assyrians, and then all that's left of the Jewish people in their being a sovereign kingdom is the kingdom of Judah. Well, that has already happened. It's only the kingdom of Judah, and it's the lineage of David that reigns in Jerusalem. And we see these kings just sort of slowly getting worse. And then Hezekiah pops up, and he happens to be a really good king. He brings about reformation. He helps tear down idols and false worship. And the people really loved Hezekiah, but then his kid is Manasseh, and Manasseh is the worst. And Manasseh puts up all of the false temples and idols back in Jerusalem and puts some really nasty stuff in Jerusalem even at the temple, um, Manasseh repents at the very end of his life and tries to get rid of all that stuff, but his son puts it all back. He doesn't reign for very long, and then we get to King Josiah. And when I think of King Josiah, this is what I think of, because the first sentence in, in 2 Kings 22 is, Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was uh, Jedidah, and the daughter of Adiah of Bozkath. Now, that makes me think, all right, there's a kid who's eight years old. His dad, at least, if not his parents, are gone at eight years old. And he inherits all of the wealth and power of the entire kingdom. And so I can't help but think of it when I'm reading about King Josiah. I can't help but think about Batman. Because the story of Batman follows a very similar path, right? Bruce Wayne was a little kid when his parents were shot in the alley in Gotham City. And this little kid who is only seeing evil because Gotham is so dark and evil his whole life, this is what Josiah has seen. It's just evil around him. The culture has become terrible and sinful. His family situation was pretty dark, and all he's seen is darkness, but now he has all the wealth and power. At eight years old, Bruce Wayne becomes a billionaire. At eight years old, Josiah becomes king of Judah. And that's what I think of. That's the picture in my head. And interestingly, in spite of all of that, verse 2 says this, Josiah did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Despite all of the evil that surrounded Josiah, he still managed to be righteous in God's eyes. Even though he didn't have a role model in his family, and his family history was the worst it could possibly be in the kingdom of Judah. And we'll get to how bad it is as we go through this story. But it says, now it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah, meaning he was 26 years old because he's been reigning for 18 years and he started at eight, that the king sent Shaphan 
the scribe, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, that he may count money which has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have gathered from the people. And let them deliver it into the hand of those doing the work, who are the overseers in the house of the Lord, and let them give it to those who are in the house of the Lord, doing the work to repair the damages of the house, to carpenters and builders and masons, to buy timber and hewn stone to repair the house. However, there need be no accounting made with them of the money delivered into their hand because they deal faithfully. So this is the story of Josiah. Eight years old, he's surrounded by darkness. His dad's gone. He's king. He inherits the kingdom of Judah. He has no real role models, but somehow he's managed to be somewhat good. And he has this servant, Shaphan, who's a scribe, and he tells him to go see Hilkiah the high priest and go to the temple. And after 18 years of living in this culture where it's been pretty dark and dim, and the remnants of what his father and grandfather had created in the kingdom of Judah, which is just a pretty sinful and evil culture, he has decided that the temple needs to be repaired. Now, he doesn't really know God, but he's looking at his kingdom, and he sees the center of the kingdom is really the temple. That's the pride of the Jewish people, and it's gone in disarray. And he says, we're going to repair it. And he picks carpenters and tradesmen and craftsmen who were so well thought of that he knew that he didn't even have to deal with accounting. He knew they weren't going to cheat, that they were going to do what was right. And that's who he chooses, and he goes to fix the temple. So he's 26 years old, surrounded by darkness, and he has decided to fix the temple. Now, I bring this up because of this next piece. Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. So Shaphan the scribe went to the king, bringing the king word, saying, Your servant has gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of those who do the work, who oversee the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan the scribe showed the king, or showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. So what happened is the servant of Josiah found out that the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible, were hidden in the temple. They had gone missing. No one had known about them. They had been forgotten about. They were lost in the temple for a long time. But now they've been found. Shaphan reads them and sees how important it is, and he needs to tell King Josiah. Now, the reason this, I think, is important is there might be a person you've heard of. All right, his name is Billy Graham. Have you ever heard of Billy Graham? Most people have, even though he's no longer with us, he's still a pretty famous name, particularly in the church, because he was America's most powerful evangelist for decades. Millions of people came to Jesus because of Billy Graham. That's a name you know. Have you ever heard of this name? Mordecai Ham. I might edit in crickets for the sound there. Because no, you haven't. But Mordecai Ham is the evangelist who led Billy Graham to Christ. This is Mordecai moment right here. Shaphan got a hold of the books of the law, read them, and thought the king needs to read this. The king needs to know about this. And Shaphan became the catalyst for Josiah, who led the greatest revival in Judah's history before the Babylonian exile. This is in, in the monarchy of Israel. This is the greatest revival that existed. And it's because someone took the books of the law and made sure Josiah heard them. To me, that's like Mordecai, Ham, seeing this young teenager in his event tent and thinking that kid needs to hear the gospel. 
and making sure that Billy Graham heard it. And when Billy Graham got a hold of the gospel, it exploded. And so Josiah is about to hear the words of God. So now it, it happened. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, that he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, Achor the son of Micaiah, Shaphan the scribe, and Asiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me, for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is aroused against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So what happens? Shaphan is shaken by what's written in this book, in the Bible, in the Torah, in the first five books. And he says the king needs to hear this. And he reads all of the words of the scriptures to Josiah. When Josiah hears God's words, and he hears the moral code and the moral law that is written in the Torah, he tears his clothes and weeps because he realizes how far gone the kingdom of Judah is to the promises that God gave them and how far away they are from following the God that brought them out of Egypt, that brought them to the land flowing with milk and honey, that gave them this place that's supposed to be dwelling with them in the temple. And he weeps and he knows that they've brought God's judgment on themselves. And he weeps and he asks to seek out a prophet to see what God has to say about the kingdom of Judah. So Hilkiah the priest and Ahikam, Akbor, Shaphan, and Asiah went to Huldah, the, the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, the son of Harhaz, keeper of the wardrobe. She dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter. And they spoke with her. So they go and meet this prophet, prophetess. And she said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring calamity on this place and on its inhabitants, all the words of this book which the king of Judah has read. So right now, it's not looking too good. Josiah has recognized that they've earned judgment. They've earned God's judgment because of the way that the culture has behaved. And he's gone and sought out a prophetess to give him insight into what they now know. Now he's torn apart. He's humbled. He's beaten down by the fact that the culture has gotten so bad, a culture that he's in control of because he's the king. And he's weeping. And so far, she's saying, God's judgment is coming and you deserve it. Verse 17, it says, Because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be aroused against this place and shall not be quenched. That is terrifying. God is saying, this is coming and you can't stop it. And you've earned it because you've worshipped other gods. You've worshipped other things. You've given up on me. You've defiled the temple. This, you can't stop it. It's coming. Then verse 18 happens, and there's a word at the beginning that tells you a tone shift is coming. But, but as for the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord in this manner, you shall speak to him, thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the words which you have heard. Because your heart was tender, and you humbled yourself before the Lord. When you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become a desolation and a curse, and you tore your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, says the Lord. Surely, therefore, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the calamity which I will bring on this place. So they brought back word to the king. So this is the first half of the story. Eight-year-old kid surrounded in darkness for 18 years as he reigns over the kingdom of Judah, and he finally decides, let's fix up the temple. They find the words of God. They find the words of the law, the books of Moses. 
And Shaphan reads it and says, the king needs to hear it. He reads it to the king. He's heartbroken over what has happened in the kingdom he presides over. And he recognizes that based on what God has said, they deserve judgment. And he asks to find out what's going to happen. The prophetess tells him he's right. They do deserve judgment, and they will get judgment. Judgment is coming from God because God's promises are fulfilled. God has promised judgment. But for Josiah, as long as Josiah lives, that judgment will not come because Josiah's heart was tender to God and repentant. When Josiah heard the words of God, he felt shame and guilt, and he repented. He tore his clothes and wept. He acted with a heart of repentance and turned himself back towards God, and he wanted to get right what was wrong. And he was willing to accept God's decision because he recognized God as the authority. And he knew that they deserve judgment, but God will withhold judgment as long as Josiah lives because of the humility and repentant heart of Josiah. So this is the first half of revival. When we think of revival, we think of the tent. We think of a revival tent and hands going up in the air and hundreds of people or thousands of people coming to Jesus and weeping at the altar. It's not how it starts. Revival starts with the individual. Just like Mordecai Ham and Billy Graham, he got to that one kid, and it changed America for decades. When it came to Josiah, Shaphan found the words of the law and was impacted and read them to Josiah, and it got to the individual first. Josiah, the individual, was repentant and humble before God and turned his heart back to him. And what made him humble? What made him repent? It was the words of Scripture. In its totality, in its context. That's what drove Josiah to repentance. And it's also what drove Shaphan to share it with Josiah. And so the first parts of revival are the individual. The individual must come to the word of God, to the standard of God, and come to a place where they understand they need to be repentant. If you don't know you're sick, you don't think you need a cure. But Josiah found out how off course the kingdom of Judah was through the words of God. And when he was confronted with them, he felt repentant before him because he was confronted with the truth without skipping any of it. And so the word of God leads the individual to repentance. What happens from there? Let's find out. Chapter 23. Now the king, Josiah, he sent them to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. The king went up because uh, went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and with him all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, then the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the house of the Lord. So the same words, the scriptures that caused Josiah to repent, compelled him to give that same message to all the people. He had been so humbled by what God said, he knew that the, other, the rest of Israel needs to know about this. And so as king, with his influence, he is able to gather all the people at Jerusalem, and he does, and he reads in front of them the books of the law. He gives them God's words in its totality, in context. It says, then the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in the book. And all the people took a stand 
for the covenant. So this is what happened. Josiah is changed forever as an individual. He's been humbled by God's words. His heart has turned back to God, but he's so changed, he can't keep it to himself. He needs everybody to know. And so he gathers the people in Jerusalem and he reads out loud the same words that got him to change. And not only does he read the words to them, but then he commits in front of them and makes a public declaration that he's going to live by the words that God has ordained. And he led by example. Not only did he repent, he made a proclamation in front of the nation that he was repentant and going to live for God the rest of his life. And he led by example. And those who listened to him followed. And they stood for God as well because they got to hear the word of God in context, in full, and they got to see a leader in front of them live according to the words of God. So it starts with the individual, and the individual gets to the people they have influence over, and they share with them what has changed them. And then they live it out in front of them. Those are the steps to revival. But there's more. It said, And the king commanded Hilkiah, the priest, the priest of the second order, and the doorkeepers, to bring out the temple of the Lord, all the articles that were made for Baal and Asherah, and for the hosts of heaven. And he turned them outside of Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried them, carried their ashes to Bethel. So what you're seeing now is not only has Josiah repented, not only has he made a public proclamation of his repentance, but now he's putting those words into action in front of everybody. So he's not just, he didn't just do it in his heart and he didn't just say it out loud. Now he's living, he's walking the walk. And what he does is he tears down idols, false temples to false gods, and he burns them and tears them down. And he removes the things that have caused people to go astray. So verse 5, Then he removed the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in high places in the cities of Judah and in the places all around Jerusalem, and those who burned incense to Baal, the sun, to the moon, and to the constellations, and to all the hosts of heaven. And he brought out the wooden image from the house of the Lord to the brook of the Kidron outside Jerusalem, burned it, at the brook of Kidron and ground it to ashes and threw it to ashes on the graves of the common people. So he destroys this idol and then throws it on graves to desecrate it so that it could never be used again. He's cleaning out what has brought rot to the society. Then he tore down the ritual booths of the perverted persons that were in the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the wooden image, and brought all the priests in the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba. Also he broke down the high places at the gates, which were at the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were to the left of the city gate. Nevertheless, the priests of the high places did not come up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they ate unleavened bread among the brethren. So what has gone on? He is getting rid of all of the idols and all of the false worship and all of the false temples in Israel are in Judah, surrounding Jerusalem. But then it gets to this interesting piece where he's kicking people out of the temple who acted as priests and priestesses for other gods. What were they doing? There's a reason he calls it perverted, because they were actually performing prostitution in the temple of God in Jerusalem. That's how bad things have gotten in this culture. That's how bad his dad and grandfather allowed things to get in Israel, that even the temple that's supposed to be separate and only for worship of Yahweh is now used to worship other gods, and they were actually in that worship utilizing prostitution in the temple of God. How sad is that? But Josiah's not done. 
It says, and he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, that no man might take his son or daughter pass through the fire of Molech. Well, just so you know what that means, he's desecrating an idol so that it can never be used again. This idol was a statue made out of metal with arms that held out, and they would light the statue on fire so that the arms were burning bright with heat, and that's where they would put infants on the arms, the burning arms of metal to appease the god Molech so that they would have good crops. That's how bad things have gotten, and he destroys that. He destroys that idol. Verse 11, then, so there's more, he removed the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun at the entrance to the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the officer who was in the court, and he burned the chariots of the son of, of the sun with fire. The altars that were on the roof, the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, the king broke down and pulverized there and threw dust into the brook Kidron. Then, more, the king defiled the high places that were east of Jerusalem, which were on the south of the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon, king of Israel, had built for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Sidonians, for Chemosh, the abomination of the Moabites, and Milcom, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he broke in pieces the sacred pillars and cut down the wooden images, then filled their places with the bones of men. So not only was he destroying these places, he was destroying them and making sure that according to the pagan rituals, that they would be unusable. That's why he put the bones on top of them. So to di divert the ability of the pagans to reuse these things or to rebuild them. That's what it means to desecrate them. And so he's taking care of the temple. He's taking care of Jerusalem. Now he's going east of Jerusalem and wiping out all of the false idols there. And then it says, he's not done. Moreover, the altar was at Bethel. And the high place, which Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin, had made both the altar and the high place, he broke down and he burned the high place and crushed it to powder and he burned the wooden image. As Josiah turned, he saw the tombs that were on the mountain and he sent the bones out to the tombs and burned them on the altar and defiled it according to the word of the Lord, which is what the man of God proclaimed. Who proclaimed the words when he said, what gravestone is this that I see? So the men of the city told him, it is the tomb of the man of God who came from Judah, who proclaimed these things, which you have done against the altar of Bethel. And he said, let him alone, let no one move his bones. So they say, let his bones alone with the bones of the prophet who came from Samaria. So just if that doesn't make sense to you, what's really going on is Josiah has destroyed all of the false worship inside of the kingdom of Judah. And now... He's going up to the northern kingdom of Israel, which, by the way, no longer exists. Samaria is a city, but it belongs to the Assyrians because the Assyrians took over the northern kingdom of Israel. He's going into their territory, into enemy territory, and tearing down their temples because that land belonged to the covenant people of Israel and was still under the protection of God's covenant. So even though it wasn't under his current rule diplomatically, he still is going into what God has promised and cleaning house. And he even went into the kingdom of Assyria, the biggest, baddest nation at the time, and started destroying temples in the Assyrian lands. Now Josiah also took away all the shrines and the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel had made to provoke the Lord to anger, and he did them according to all the deeds that he had done in Bethel. He executed all the priests in high places who were there and on the altars and burned men's bones on them, and he returned to Jerusalem. Then, so now he's not only taking care of the southern kingdom of Judah, he's taking care of all of the altars in the northern kingdom of, what would have been the northern kingdom of Israel, in the land that was given to the people of God. After he's cleaned all of that up, and destroyed all those temples and all of those idols. He now comes back to Jerusalem. Then, verse 21, the king commanded all the people saying, keep the Passover to the Lord your God. As it is written in this book of the covenant, such a Passover surely has never been since the days of the judges who judged Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of the Israel, 
of Israel and the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was held before the Lord in Jerusalem. So now what you see is that all this was done within the same year. And how he capstones it, how he ends it, is by celebrating the Feast of Passover. The celebration that reminded the people of Israel that God rescued them from slavery. He brought them out of slavery, out of captivity, and brought them to the land flowing with milk and honey. The escape from Egypt was because of the Passover. It was a moment when God had judged Egypt for keeping them. And his judgment was that the death of the firstborn would happen in one night in every household in Egypt. Unless lamb's blood was painted on the posts, on the top and sides of the door frame. And if the angel of death went to your house and saw it painted with lamb's blood, death would pass over you, and instead of receiving death, you receive life. That's the feast that Josiah ends all of this with. In the city of Jerusalem, with all of the people, after calling people back to God, bringing them back, to God through the scriptures and then through cleaning up their act and worshiping the only one true God, they celebrate that with Passover, with the very thing that points to Jesus, lamb's blood that brings life, not death. Defeat death by the blood of the lamb. That's Passover. It also happens to be the same day Jesus was crucified. Jesus was crucified on Passover. And that's what they're celebrating. And this Passover in particular was unlike any Passover that had ever existed. This is the greatest Passover celebration in Israel's history. Moreover, Josiah put away those who consulted mediums and spiritists and household gods and idols and the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. And so what we get is that Josiah has cleaned up the act in the culture. He has brought people back to worshiping God and to understanding the mercy and grace that God offers. That when you have a tender heart towards him and humility towards him, that he brings life, not death, because of your repentant hearts. And he's done it, and his motivation is the words of the law. His motivation for doing that is scripture. Verse 25, now before him, there was no king like him, who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might, according to the law of Moses, nor after him did any arise like him. So this is what scripture says about King Josiah. He's the greatest king in the history of Israel. There was no king who loved God with his heart, soul, and might like Josiah, not even David. He is the greatest king in Israel's history. And now we see his end. Nevertheless, the Lord did not turn from the fierceness of his great wrath, which his anger was aroused against Judah because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. So God had not forgotten the evil of the people. They were just held back from judgment because of Josiah's leadership and because of the revival that spurred from Josiah's leadership. And the Lord said, I will also remove Judah from my sight as I have removed Israel and will cast off the city Jerusalem, which I have chosen, and the house of which I said, my name shall be there. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? In his days, Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, and the aid of the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates, and King Josiah went against him. And Pharaoh Necho killed him at Megiddo which, by the way, is translated Armageddon, when he confronted him. Then his servants moved his body in a chariot from Megiddo, or Armageddon, and brought him to Jerusalem and buried him in his own tomb. And the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, anointed him and made him king in his father's place. Now here's a really interesting part of the story. The capstone of what Josiah had done after He himself repented and turned to God. And then after that, 
preaching to the people and teaching the people the words of God and then making a proclamation to live by them in front of the people and the people following him and then him going and cleaning house and cleaning up the act and getting back to the way that getting back to God's moral standard in the society and leading them through that the capstone of all of that was the celebration of Passover the celebration of the people of Israel being freed from Egypt. It's interesting that Josiah's end, which signifies that God's judgment will now come on Judah, because the judgment of God was only held off by Josiah being alive. The judgment of God can now come upon the people of Israel, the people of Judah, because a pharaoh of Egypt killed Josiah. Now, that is just an interesting little open and close to Josiah's life. The capstone of his life and revival was celebrating the escape from Egypt, and it is a pharaoh of Egypt who ended Josiah's life. But throughout his life, he is known, and he's written in Scripture as the greatest king in Judah's history because he loved God with everything that he had, and he led the people to love God as well. And because of that, the greatest revival in the monarchy piece of history in Israel is this revival that Josiah led. And how does it happen? What are the stages of revival? What is the life cycle of revival? It doesn't start with a big tent meeting. You don't get to choose revival, 6.30 p.m., be there or you'll miss out on God's moving. You don't get to choose God's schedule. It doesn't start with a big movement of people and hands flying up in the air. It starts with the individual. It starts with you. In our own understanding, in our own history, we look at Billy Graham and we saw that it started the greatest evangelist in American history because Mordecai Ham took the time, a guy we've never heard of, took the time to give the gospel to a person who was more concerned about baseball than Jesus. But that kid ended up being the greatest evangelist in American history. In Israel's history, it happened to be that Shaphan, a scribe, a guy you probably heard, heard of for the first time tonight, because he took the time when he read God's words to understand that he needed to share it with someone. It just so happened that the guy he shared it with was Josiah, who happened to be the greatest evangelist in Israel's history. And he turned the whole nation around. Well, it starts with an individual. It starts with you. And it starts with a repentant heart because of the words of God. When we get confronted with the truth and God's standard, we should understand that we don't measure up to it but be really thankful that there's a gospel of grace, that God has paved a way for us to get back to him because we don't measure up to his glory. But if we're repentant and humble before him, we're reconnected to him. Isn't it interesting that even Josiah, he spent 26 years of his life not knowing God's words, but because he was repentant and humble, it's written about him that he lived always in the ways of God, not turning from the right or to the left, that he's the greatest king in Israel's history even though he didn't come to God until he was 26. It means that your past is the past. If you come to God and you repent now, the past is gone. You can repent and turn to him, and God can spring you forward, and he's only looking at that part of your life. He's letting that go because the punishment for the wickedness, the punishment for sin, is taken care of on the cross. The blood of the Lamb has given you life instead of death. It starts with the individual. It starts with the person who's repentant before God because of how perfect he is and how much we're not. Because the words of God tell us the truth. And when confronted with the truth, we know we don't measure up to him. But we turn our hearts to him because he loves us and he offers us a way out. So it starts with you and it starts with repentance. Then Josiah looks at the people he has influence over. Now, we're not all kings of nations. I would think none of us are. But we do have influence over people. 
there are people that matter to us that we do have some sort of influence over. If we were like Josiah, if what God has said mattered so much and changed us so radically and became so much a part of who we are that we couldn't help but have it spill out of us and share it with the people around us, they would notice. And not only if it spilled out of us at every turn, but if we also proclaimed to live by it and then followed that up with action, it would make a difference. That's what Josiah did. He was confronted with truth. He repented. He shared that with the people he had influence over. He proclaimed he would live by it. And then he followed it up and he walked the walk. That's all it takes for revival. I'll tell you, I desperately think that we need one. I don't think that every single person in here necessarily needs one. But I do think that as a whole, our community, our state, our nation, our world desperately needs a revival. Here's a stat that's pretty stunning. Over the last three years, what we have found out through Pew Research is that American church attendance is at 47%. It's the first time in US history that a minority of the people attend church in our country. At the same time, depression and anxiety and suicide are at an all-time high. Hope is needed. We have hope. It's found in repentance and it's found in the gospel and the world desperately needs it. And God has asked the church to be the one to offer it. We are his ambassadors here on earth. And so if we're like Josiah, then we would take the time to repent, be serious, find out who we have any sort of influence over, and share that amazing news with them because there is no better news than the gospel. It is life-saving for eternity. And then live by it so they can see the fruits of the labor. That's all. That's the life cycle of revival. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for this evening. Thank you for King Josiah. God, I personally pray that I could live a fraction of the life that Josiah lived. I hope that we can find a way to be a fraction as faithful as he was to you and to the people around us who need to hear your word. God, help us to find a way to communicate with people who need you. And I also pray for anyone who hears this, is in this room or who listens to the recording, that if they need you, that they would take this moment to come to you, to repent and turn their hearts to you and to turn to your word to find out more. God, help us to share that with people who need it. And thank you for the opportunity we have tonight to make a difference in this community. Thank you for what we're doing in our Weekend of Hope. Thank you that we're making lunches to go to people who wouldn't otherwise have them. God, I pray that that's an impact that's made and that people know that they're receiving food because a group of people love you and love them. God, I pray, pray that as we close out this night and as we head to do our act of service, that, that we don't miss the life cycle of revival. And that we take a moment in our own time with you to figure out what role you'd like us to play in it. Because we live in a culture that desperately needs you. Help us to figure out how to give them your message. In Jesus' name, amen.